Good afternoon, folks, and welcome to our webinar today on NIMI groups in mental health. I'm delighted to, to have you along with us this afternoon. And my name is Mark Besick. I'm the national lead for the NIMI networks. And before we get underway, we're going to just do a little bit of housekeeping. We've got some tweets, uh, uh, addresses there as well. We'd like to engage with us online. That'd be super to have that today. And um, let me just queue up the next slide. So basically, um, everyone's uh, on mute. Um, there's some accessibility options we're going to go through in a minute for how to use this Teams Live event if, uh, if that's helpful for you. And again, if, you, if you're struggling to hear us or see us, um, see if you can get near a better Wi-Fi signal. If you can connect to your machine using an Ethernet cable direct to a network, that'll really help you as well. We'd really like to engage with you uh, on the Q&A. Um, so please put in, you know, where you're from, what kind of profession you're, you're in and, and what any particular topics you want us to cover this afternoon. We've got some cracking speakers lined up for you. We're going to do a recording of this session. So that's available for people after the event. If uh, you want to share that with colleagues or, or go back over some of the, uh, the content from today. And if there are any particular comments or chat that you want to share or any particular experiences, you know, please use that. And, and uh, Dawn and Alex will be looking after the chat for you a bit later on. Also, if you've got any particular examples of using NEMI groups, if you're already using some of that as well, that'd be really helpful to hear about. What also we'd like to do is, is with, with the resources we generate from this session today and also the recording, uh, we'd like to use the attendee list from this meeting, uh, this session to, to share these things with you afterwards. If you would not like us to contact you after the session, please let us know in the chat. We won't necessarily, we don't have to publish that bit, but we just let us know if you'd rather us not contact you afterwards um, with the resources we generate today, then please let us know. So your screen should look something like this. Um, you've got access to some uh, abilities within the Teams Live events to, to change your playback speed, to highlight certain speakers. You can have captions. You can also uh, pause the event as well. So some things to help you there if those are, if those are helpful for you. What we'd also like to do is just get a temperature check of where people are at in terms of, of near me. And what I'm going to ask uh, Dawn or Alex to do is just to paste into the chat. There's a link to uh, just a really short two question poll. Or if you've got a, a handheld device with you, you want to scan that QR code that's on the screen there. It's just an ask, just a quick question about, you know, your knowledge of, of near me groups and whether you're using near me groups or not, just to see where people are at today. We'll do a little poll at the end as well. So um, if uh, that's going to go in the chat, but it's also on screen as well. If you'd like to use that QR code and it'll just take you a very short period of time. Whilst you're doing that, As I said, we've got Dawn from the near me team and Alex from the, uh, the National Mental Health Team, the Scottish Government, supporting the Q&A and, and um, the, the session a bit later on. Delighted to say we've got Tracy Tyler with us this, this afternoon. So she's a Sakuta Success Manager from uh, Induction Healthcare Group, Attend Anywhere. Also followed by uh, Dr Simon Stewart. And then we've got Chris Wright from uh, Digital Mental Health speaking as well around the kind of national picture and, and what uh, what where did NAMI groups fit within the national picture? So a great, excellent lineup for us this afternoon. So without further ado, I'm going to just basically, Tracy's going to speak about you know, what, what is NAMI groups, the kind of core features, uh, what the future plans are for that. We've got Simon Stewart speaking about the experience of NAMI groups and how they've used it in Lanarkshire. And then Chris is going to speak about you know, where did NAMI groups fit within the national digital picture for mental health. And then we'll have a chance for, for you, the audience, uh, and anybody else just to pitch questions, have a conversation. Hopefully the presentations will provoke some questions, maybe some discussion, and maybe some things you disagree with, um, but we're very much open for some interaction and some um, engagement. So without further ado, I think we'll just crack on and just hand over to Tracy. So while I queue Tracy's slides up, hopefully, so I'll introduce Tracy to you. There you go, Tracy, over, over to you. Great, Mark. Thanks so much. Just before we start, um, can I just check? My colleague Beth is trying to enter this meeting and she's having a message that says the event hasn't started. So I just want to check that that's not a problem for everybody or it's just maybe one off with my colleague. 
Okay, thanks, Tracy. What I'll do, I'll uh, I'll have a chat with Chris on the chat. We'll see. Uh, sorry, David, and we'll see whether that's the case. If anybody else has that, uh, if you can let us know in the Q and A if that's been anybody else's experience, that'd be really helpful as well. Thank you. Okay, do you want me to get going? Yeah, let's just crack on. Okay, Thank you, Tracy. perfect. So, good afternoon. Good afternoon to you all. I'm Tracy. I'm a customer success manager at Induction Healthcare. I'm the main point of contact for, for Mark and his, uh, and his team with regards to the Attend Anywhere video conferencing platform, which you will know better in Scotland. It's branded as Near Me. So today I'm just going to give a high level overview of the Near Me group calls, what features are available in the system, what to expect from a clinician perspective, and what to expect from a service user client perspective when, you, when they join the call. So Mark, next, next slide, please. And then straight on to the one after as well. Great, thank you. So near me, it's a web based video consultation platform currently utilised by NHS Scotland, Social Security Scotland, NHS Wales, HSE Ireland and NHS Trust throughout NHS England. It's also used in non healthcare settings too, for example, um, DWP in, in England. You may already be familiar with it by using it for your individual one to one consultations for your clients, um, where you can com comfortably have five or six participants on the call. The beauty of group consultations is that you can have up to 60 people on a call at once and we've tested it at for up to 100. So we're, we're, we're confident that it will work for, for more than 60, participant, 60 participants. The client will receive a link either via text, email or letter, and it's a single point of entry. The link remains the same, which makes it simple and easy for your clients to use and join and join the calls. We don't store any patient information in the near me platform, everything's deleted once once the call ends. OK, Mark, next one, please. So you will have the, the group consultation waiting area will have been created by your local organisation administrator. Um, it's clearly defined. You can see group consultations at the bottom there. Um, it's marked. I think it's got a purple purple link around it, purple line around it. The link stays the same, which makes it simple and easy for service users to, to, to join. They don't have to keep changing links. Um, and each group consultation area can only host one session at a time. So multiple waiting areas will need to be created if you wish to host simultaneous group calls. You enter into the waiting area by clicking on the group consultation tab at the bottom of the screen. And then next slide, Mark, please. You go into the, the waiting area. Your own wait, that, that this is the, the waiting area from a consultant perspective. Once you've got callers waiting, you can see their names and details, and you'll be able to, to launch the call. There's a blue button there that says launch call. You can see how long the patient's been waiting for. You can see their name, and if there's any if there's any um, other information that you've collected from the from the uh, from the service user when they're joining the course, which is their telephone number, that will be visible too. There's a waiting hours which are configurable for your for your service. And then we've got the waiting area link, which is um, on the on the right hand side of, of the screen. It's a sh share link to waiting areas. There's a little drop down arrow next to that, and that's where you can email or text that link to to your callers, or you can copy to a clipboard. To launch the call, you just simply click on launch call, and then next next slide, Mark, please. So you. You start off with a, a self view, so that's a nice picture of me today with my red face. Um, you've got some links at the, so some tabs at the bottom of the call, which are your control buttons. And on the right hand side, I can see the, the caller's names, and there's a little red cross, a little white cross next to them, where I can click on the cross, which will remove that caller from the call if you don't want to, to have them in, in the meeting. The controls at the bottom, We've got the, 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 you're probably very familiar with them. You've got the mute call button. We've got the um, video call button that you can you can switch, uh, you can mute as well. You can share your screen. And there's also in the middle the chat functionality. Now with the group consultations chat, we are able to enable the chat feature if you want, or we can disable it. So if you don't think that chat's appropriate for your call, then you don't have to have to use it. That's a setting. It's easy to easy to configure. The administrators will probably can com configure that for you, or you can do it yourself. It's, it's very straightforward. There's also a performance setting button. If you just click Enter, Mark, we might be able to see how that works. And that enables you to um, 
that the callers can see that see the layout themselves. And the next next one. Enter, sorry. You've got other controls, the three, the three dots. The three dots at the end give you access to other controls as well that you can full view screen. Um, you can mute everybody and um, they're just other other functionality that you, you've got available to you. On the right hand side now at the top, we've got admit all. And if you go to enter, we'll now admit all the other callers. So next slide, Mark, please. So there we can see the other participants in the in the call we're all together now i'm in the top on my screen i'm in the top left and i've got my full name visible and all the participants have got their initial showing we've also got the ability now in near me to be able to view patients initials or their full name that will depend again on the settings and a configuration tab and that's entirely up to you to just have those discussions with your administration administrator to be able to enable those settings if you want to do So callers don't see the first and last names, they just see the initials and the full name of the service provider, again, depending on what that configuration is. You've got some video, um, video tile options. To make a particular video tile fill the screen, you just click onto that tile. You'll then see the other callers in smaller windows on, on the right hand side and you'll be visible on the, on, the, on the full screen. To return to the initial layout, just use the layout control button and you go back to, to where you were before. If you just click on the next slide, please, Mark. So you've also got, if you click into the tile, you've got some individual controls as well. Um, we've recently added breakout rooms also to the group chat function, group, group call functionality. So you're able to take your callers off some of them into, into individual breakout rooms if you want to do that. Um, there are full details and user guides available to everybody that Mark has if you want to understand more about breakout rooms. Next slide, please, Mark. So that's just a, uh, that was just a, a screenshot of what it looks like if you were to click on the tile and have the a, a particular participant visible and then them visible down the right hand side. Next slide, Mark, please. And that's where the breakout room functionality is in that button at the bottom. If you were to click on that, that then takes you into breakout rooms and um, you're able to start to develop and create the, the breakout rooms. Next one, please, Mark. So that was um, a quick overview of it from a consultant perspective. I'm now just going to talk through what a service user will see when they join when they join a call from their mobile device, whether that be a laptop, phone, tablet um, any of any of those providing they've got a camera and a microphone and access to an, an internet they will follow the link which will have been sent to them either by an email or a text message or a letter and the first screen that they come across is is this one in the top left which is uh, as you start your near me call you'll see a pop-up message asking to use your camera and your microphone and you can say accept to that and then the near me calls automatically test your camera, microphone and network speed. And if there are any problems, you'll see a notification. Once the microphone and once, once the camera and the microphone are detected, you'll see the group name and any information your, your near me provider wants you to read before joining and more information on their service. So, so that's all configurable. Click the next step button to continue. So next slide, please, Mark. You'll then be asked to complete some personal details, your name, surname, telephone number, and these details identify the caller to their near me provider. The details are kept on the platform until the end of the call and then they are deleted. No other callers will see any details except your initials unless the provider specifically configures the near me system to present the full names. Use the blue uh, next step button to continue. Next slide then, Mark, please. And if you agree to the terms of use, you tick the box and then you can enter the waiting area and join the group call. While you're waiting, you might hear some music and any other messages depending on how your near me provider has set that call up. So next slide, please, Mark. So now I've joined the call. I'm with the service uh, consultant and then they've got three other people on this group, as you can see there. 
My microphone's muted on entry, and then at the bottom of the screen, I've got very similar controls to the service consultant, um, the microphone button, which I can mute, and the video button that I can mute. I can chat as well, providing it's been switched on, and I can uh, tile use the tile button to to adjust the screen to, to see certain participants if I want to do that as well. It's very similar to, to what we've just been through. So next slide, please, Mark. The next development of any kind of major impact, I think, will be in our release nine, which is due out at the end of October. And at the moment, group consultation calls last for a couple of hours. That's going to be extended to four hours, which I think will improve things all around for, for all users. And that's going to be released at the end of October. And next slide, please, Mark. That's it. That was a quick high level overview. I uh, hope that's helped. I know Mark's got lots of information about group consultations, um, a full library of user guides, etc. And we're available from induction if you need any any further help or assistance with anything to do with group consultations. Thank you. That's great, Tracy. Thank you, Thank you so much. That's a really nice uh, clear run through uh, of the functions and features of the group's platform. And again, I think that the four hour waiting, uh, the four hour limit on the time is going to be uh, welcomed by many clinicians who are particularly running kind of, you know, uh, quite intensive uh, longer groups. And I think that the two hour thing has has um, uh, caused a bit of difficulty on occasions, but I think four hours is going to make a really big odds. Just a quick um, update for those folk that maybe you're struggling to see the webinar. We've checked it's running OK. If you can just refresh your device or, or rejoin the meeting, you should be able to, to um, join us for the rest of the sessions now. Um, so thank you, Tracy. We're going to now just move on to uh, Simon Stewart. So unfortunately, sadly, uh, Emily Path couldn't uh, join us for this afternoon uh, <clears throat> to do her presentation. However, uh, Dr. Simon Stewart gallantly stepped in at incredibly short notice. Um, and I recorded uh, a conversation I had with uh, Simon yesterday afternoon. Uh, and now we have we have eight minutes of Simon speaking about how they've been using uh, NIMI groups in, in, in Lanarkshire. So I'm going to just uh, unshare my one section and then I will queue up Simon and he should be coming up there and then once I press play I will just just go. So I'm uh, I'm a consultant clinical psychologist and I'm the digital lead for NHS Lanarkshire Psychological Services. The do with CMS into NIMI groups. So broadly, that's a program of rolling groups in uh, in adult mental health services. So there's three groups that we're trying now to run on a, on a continual rolling basis, plus groups in other services. So um, psychological therapies for older people, um, learning disability services, um, clinical health, um, quite a lot of different services across the piece now have used NIMI groups in, in some way or another. And what we're doing is trying to run clearly, clearly defined evidence based groups using this platform. So the, the three, for example, that we're running in, um, in adult mental health services are Survive and Thrive, which is a very well established group um, created by Ness, uh, the Emotional Resources Group, which was the brainchild of the wonderful Tom Bacon in Fife, who's been really, really helpful in in assisting us to try taking it online. And then we're also running um, an NBCT group as well. Um, there, there's an ACT group currently just being started up uh, by our colleagues and older adults. Um, a couple of different psychoeducational groups have been tried. So really we are, we're trying to do as much as possible that the technology allows us to do. 
we have all these data and we have a very, very willing assistant psychologist who is, is looking at this, but her time is taken up with other more pressing things at the moment. So I would be, I can't say with any honesty, these are the outcomes. What I can say though, is that just eyeballing the data, it looks pretty decent. And what I can say confidently is that we've been able to get people into groups very quickly. So in terms, you know, quite like everybody, we, like everybody, I think it's fair to say that managing our waiting lists is a challenge. Being able to do this work uh, has really, really helped with that. We've been able, for instance, to signpost people fairly quickly uh, from an initial referral into an online group if they are willing to do that and if the group is suitable for them. That's a really, really key thing. We're not trying to force people into doing things. There are people who, for all sorts of reasons, won't be keen to, to do this kind of uh, this kind of intervention at all. But for those who are, for those who are digitally equipped, who are willing, who um, who who basically are willing to give it a go. Um, what we're seeing is that it seems to be working pretty well. I'm not <laughs> again, my you know, that, that, that psychologist's caution won't really permit me to say any more than that until I've until I've seen um, some analysis. But uh, but yeah, so far things feel pretty good. We, we have had, being honest, people who have started a group and be unable to finish it because of technological difficulties. Um, we can maybe talk about that a little more. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to pretend otherwise. But again, anecdotally, because I've not seen the data yet, but anecdotally, what we're hearing from the people who are signing up and engaging and for whom it's working OK, they're getting a lot out of it. Um, this, this seems to be good engagement. Um, once people get used to that slightly odd thing of talking to a screen and talking to multiple people on a screen, the flow seems to be pretty good. Um, so yeah, it's as I say, um, I'm cautious about saying too much before I've actually seen properly, properly analysed data. But again, the initial soundings seem to be reasonably positive. It's, it's fair to say that the, uh, the Clinical Governance and Information Governance Departments in NHS Lanarkshire are extremely rigorous. And the, the expectation I think I have when I'm trying to take any innovation to them is that they are going to interrogate it quite a bit and say, really, have you thought all this through? That immediately can give rise to thoughts where you go, oh, is this worth it? Yes, because what's the alternative? And for me, if the alternative, you know, if the choice is basically between trying to do something that's going to involve a little bit of discussion and examination and actually very useful and important consideration of doing what we're doing safely or not doing anything at all, I'm going to go with that former one because that's ultimately what we are trying to do here. We're trying to help people. We're trying to broaden the choices that um, that we can offer. So within the wider mental health and learning disabilities uh, department, um, it was really helpful for me uh, in the earlier days to collaborate with with some of the like minded folks so from psychiatry, from occupational therapy, those two in particular, and and kind of present a united front and that really really did help us get things off the ground. Then in terms of getting the day to day stuff up and running, um, it, it's the same challenges that we would have doing things non digitally. It requires clarity about what we're doing. It requires a commitment. It does involve recognizing that, yes, everybody is busy and sometimes it feels easier to say no. But if if you are passionate about doing this or if you can see the need to do this, sell it to your bosses in whatever way you can, get the management buy-in. Again, I'm incredibly lucky in Lanarkshire to, to have that, to have wonderful managers above me who have been really, really supportive of, of this work and who've, you know, who share the, the understanding and the interest in, in keeping it on track. But get your management buy-in, look for like-minded people and not just in your immediate sphere look a little bit wider look for people with whom you can collaborate and then it is basically just about trying it out making that commitment and i think recognizing that we're not going to get it right first time so again it's it's an iterative process you know in a nutshell any kind of you know 
plan, do, study, act approach is going to be your friend here. You're not going to go into this and it's all going to work first time. There are always, always going to be teething troubles and hassles and unexpected things that go wrong. OK, you know, it's about keeping an eye on the bigger picture. What ultimately are we doing this work for? We are trying to help a larger number of people at any given time. It's about thinking about your values. You know, what, what are you ultimately doing this work for? What matters to you? And if, if running online groups feels like a way that you can move towards what matters, engage with it. Don't beat yourself up when it goes wrong, which it will. And final thing I'll say, actually, which is really, really important, the, the national support around this has been magnificent. So Mark has been an absolute shining star. NVCS um, have been absolutely wonderful. And um, speaking to all sorts of different staff in, in other boards, people like Erica Skinner in Grampian, you know, again, all sorts of people that I've come across through through this little piece of work, but we're all there to support each other. So again, you know, if you're thinking about doing this, please do recognize there's an ever, ever growing national support team out there and we're a friendly bunch and that help really, really is invaluable, I think. OK, that's uh a really good little summary there from uh, Simon. Um, again, I think just let me just bring myself back up here. There we go. So yeah, in terms of, of, of Simon's ability to, to kind of tackle some of their waiting lists, um, provide choice for people, get alongside like-minded people in your uh, health board area to support you with these projects and, and that keeping patient focus was, was a key message really there. And what I'd like to do is, is we'll, we'll put links in the chat to, to the, the websites that Tracy mentioned, which were the, the kind of our group consultation website and our tech site with all our advice and guidance on there, but also to the, 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 the National VC Services team that um, Simon mentioned where you can get technical support, you can get back up, you can email them and phone them during the working day. If you're getting stuck, if you're struggling to get people into your groups or you just need some advice for testing local networks, all that kind of thing, the, the, the guys at the, the, the VC services are really good at, um, at, at problem solving those kind of things. So your, your groups are successful and they run smoothly. So I would I would urge you to you know, have a click on those links that we're going to chuck in the chat. Um, you to have a look at. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to just queue up the um, next few slides. We've got Chris Wright coming up next. I'm going to just pull those up there uh, and do that and then bear with me. There we go. OK, so I think if Chris is ready to go, we'll hand over to Chris Wright, a National Advisor for Digital Mental Health and Head of Programme for Digital Mental Health in the Scottish Government. And we'll just wait for him to appear next to his slides and then we can get cracking. There we go. On you go, Chris. Thank you. That's great. Thanks very much, Mark. Um, so hi, everybody. Uh, I am Chris Wright, the Digital Mental Health Advisor in the Scottish Government, uh, but also the, the head for the Digital Mental Health Programme. Uh, so I'm just going to discuss a wee bit around the, the kind of wider digital context and then have uh, specific information around about the, the Near Me group work that we're doing just now. Uh, so next slide, please, Mark. Uh, so the, the programme that uh, I, I'm the lead for is a national programme which really looks to maximise the use of technology across a range of, of psychology and mental health services. And the technology will be used uh, for things like delivering treatment, but also to enhance existing services. And that's specifically where uh, the Near Me uh, area operates. So we support the, the national Near Me programme really to deliver uh, video enabled therapy into uh, psychology and mental health services across Scotland. Uh, but the programme has a much wider remit uh, and really is looking at things like uh, service delivery uh, through technology, but also the, the infrastructure required to sustain this uh, beyond uh, the programme lifespan. Uh, and really, we look at a whole range of technologies, including things like gamification, uh, artificial uh, intelligence. But the, the vast majority of what we do focuses on things like computerised CBT and digital therapies uh, and the delivery of digital therapies across all, all the different regions in Scotland. 
Uh, but we also look at kind of key specialties such as adult, uh, child, young persons, uh, older adults and so on and so forth, uh, while really trying to bolster our, our uh, infrastructure our requirements as we move forward. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, as we're based in Scottish Government, we really sit uh, at the heart of, of a lot of the decision making that goes on uh, across two key policy areas. Uh, so my role actually sits uh, between the Digital Health and Care Directorate and Scottish Government uh, and the Mental Health Directorate within Scottish Government. And this really allows us to uh, be able to work in, in two spheres of influence, really being able to promote mental health to digital and promote digital to mental health ultimately. Uh, but as such, our governance structure really allows us to be interconnected into a whole range of activities and work uh, right across uh, national activity and into uh, territorial health boards and uh, local authorities as well. The Digital Mental Health Programme is a cross-sector programme uh, board and we have representation from psychology, psychiatry, uh, nursing, uh, social care, uh, as well as technical and policy. Uh, so it's a very diverse group of, of individuals and really what we, we attempt to do is to, to really influence uh, how we're developing digital across mental health, but really taking a very clinical and evidence based approach uh, to how we're working uh, in this area of activity. Next slide, please, Mark. And as such, we've been able to integrate uh, digital into uh, key mental health policies uh, across Scottish Government. Uh, so we were part of the, the 2017 digital uh, sorry, mental health strategy, uh, which was published, uh, and we will be part of the refresh strategy, which is going to be coming out in the next 12 months or so. Uh, we've also been part of the, the transition and recovery plan, which was obviously launched uh, after the COVID uh, pandemic uh, and really just emphasised the need for digital uh, to be a core part of what we do within mental health services across Scotland. Uh, and we're beginning to appear in more specialised areas such as suicide prevention and things like autism and LD uh, as we move forward. Next slide, please. Uh, and really what we try to do is we, we look at a range of technologies, uh, so not just things like uh, video enabled or near me, like Career ICBG, but a whole range of, of different ways of delivering services. And what we try to do is we really try to integrate that into existing clinical uh, service delivery models. Uh, so we're looking at things like step to match care and what we're trying to do really is to infuse uh, technology into uh, those different areas of work. And when we look at things like the step care model, what we, we, we look at really is it's the delivery of uh, digital to deliver treatment uh, at the kind of mild to moderate and below level and then technology to really enhance what we do on a daily basis uh, to the kind of higher levels uh, within the step care model. Uh, we deliver about 21 different digital therapies now uh, across Scotland and we have a, a digital mental health team within each of the uh, territorial health boards. Uh, we also work with areas like NHS and Forum to deliver uh, on things like self-help and self-management uh, as well as beginning to develop infrastructure uh, and looking at how we build up uh, innovation activity uh, and evidence uh, across the, the digital work that we do. Next slide, Mark. Thanks. And this is just an example of the, the, the kind of scale of what we now cover uh, in the digital work. So we have a, a number of digital treatments which cover conditions like depression and anxiety, uh, but also looking at specialist anxiety such as social and health. We're now beginning to work in health psychology around long term conditions also beginning to look at specialist areas such as perinatal, child and young person, uh, as well as uh, treatments for things like insomnia, uh, which have come on to our self-referral services recently. Uh, we also offer uh, the written, uh, written uh, support uh, delivered by CBT therapists, uh, as well as the video enabled work that we do with Near Me. Next slide, thanks, Mark. Uh, and the scale of delivery now is, is getting pretty significant. So we had uh, 63,184 referrals across the last 12 months. Uh, about 30,000 of those are actually across our self-referral services. Uh, within our referral services, about 85% of the referrals came directly from GP practices uh, into uh, our digital mental health teams. Uh, but we also have uh, activity online and our self-help guides, which is 12 of sitting on NHS and form, uh, were actually uh, accessed about 400,000 times in the last 12 months. So what we're beginning to see is really significant inroads uh, into almost population level uh, service uh, as we progress. Uh, next slide, thanks Mark. Uh, and the work in, uh, near me is, is of great value, I think, to mental health and, and to psychology uh, across Scotland. We saw during the pandemic a massive surge of news uh, and I was very proud to say that mental health was the, the biggest user of near me uh, during this time and has continued to be so uh, in the last 12 months and it plays a significant part 
uh, of the Near Me National Programme. Uh, what we've seen uh, in the last 12 months or so, as you'd expect, is a slight cooling down of the issues of Near Me after the pandemic as we return to, to business as usual. But what we're beginning to see actually is a stabilisation of, of the use of Near Me around about 18,600 consultations per month, so it's still a really significant amount of activity uh, across the Near Me platform within mental health. But what we're actually beginning to find now is, is it becoming a real offer of choice uh, to patients uh, within this area. Uh, the group activity which started in earnest at the beginning of this year after the platform was released at the end of last year, we begin, begin to see a real uptake uh, in the group work uh, and what we're hoping to do is, is to continue this trend uh, right the way through until the end of the year and beyond and really begin to look at Near Me as uh, a way of delivering uh, group work uh, significantly over uh, perhaps not just um, the kind of regional areas but beyond uh, and, and really beginning to think about how can we maximise this technology moving forward uh, to really maximise our offering. Uh, next slide please. Uh, I want you to touch just a wee bit about, about the evidence around video enabled therapy and it's a very new thing uh, to introduce. I know we've had it for a couple of years but as it's developed we're beginning to get a greater understanding of what it is and what it can offer as we move forward. I think it's really important to emphasise that, that this is not something which is here to replace face-to-face -face, uh, group work or face-to-face one-to-one -face uh, therapy, but really is to offer an uh, additional choice to patients moving forward. And what we've seen within the evidence is a real backing of, of, that, um, of that principle. Uh, NES did a piece of work in October 2020 where it looked at a whole range of evidence uh, across five systematic reviews. Uh, and what the take-home message was that the delivery through phone and video is equal to delivery to, of face to face. So there's no effective change uh, or difference in terms of the delivery uh, across video and telephone. But what this allows us to do is really emphasize that this is then becomes a choice uh, of, of delivery uh, as opposed to uh, a need for delivery, as it were. Uh, and I really recommend that if you're looking at uh, evidence that the document that NES built together in October uh, 2020 is absolutely excellent. It really details uh, really what you need to know in this area very succinctly. Next slide, thanks Mark. Well, what I would really emphasise is that the use of digital is about a clinical judgement. Uh, so it's not being uh, told by anybody else other than your own clinical uh, judgement, well not digital is going to work in this space. And I think Simon touched upon this in his presentation. Uh, the use of digital is a choice, uh, but the choice has to be backed up by appropriate clinical judgement. Uh, and we have a range of guidance sitting on the, the tech uh, near me website, which basically emphasizes this uh, countless times throughout the document. Uh, decisions have to include uh, to, to include patients in, in group consultations need to be made on a, a clinical client by client basis. So it's really, really important that we're not pushing people into to group therapy where they may not be appropriate, may not enjoy the experience or may not gain as much from the digital uh, experience as, as they could have done. So it's really important that we do give patients the choice of, of uh, attending in person as well as attending online. And I would say that there are a number of patients that prefer to attend online uh, for various different reasons. So again, it should be a choice that's built in uh, to any of the decision making uh, at local level. And the last slide for me, thanks Mark. So just really to emphasise what is the good use of digital. Um, so digital really should improve the patient experience. Uh, and that's the first thing I'd really emphasise. Use of digital uh, has a real opportunity to make services a lot more accessible. Uh, and make services uh, a lot more um, uh, a lot more beneficial to patients, uh, particularly in those areas where patients find it difficult to travel to services or, or patients gain a lot more uh, from being in their own home environments. Uh, I would say that digital should make things more efficient uh, and when you introduce technology it should make things more efficient uh, and as Simon said I think our experience has been that when you're delivering something at scale it takes a wee bit of time to set up. There's lots of barriers, but once it's up and running, it should be efficient and effective. Uh, and this is particularly true when you're looking at things like geographical access, uh, but also looking at how boards can develop treatments in different ways to allow uh, variability within, within the delivery, perhaps across geographical borders, uh, but also regionally. Uh, if there are services, for example, in one area which are, are, are under news, they could be then bolstered by other areas, for example. I think it's really important that what you're you're looking at is you're looking to enhance the use of, of uh, technology uh, as it progresses. Um, so there are lots of advantages that you need to be aware of within technology uh, and really you should be designing services so that it really maximizes those advantages. 
But it's also true that you have to be aware of the disadvantages, and this is particularly true around uh, clinical safety, for example. So it's been very, very mindful as to what does the digital service not offer uh, and actually how do you build that into your service delivery? And I think the last point I'll make is digital services evolve and change over time. Uh, the greater understanding that you have as a, as a clinical uh, member of staff, the more you can get out of digital as you move forward. So it's really important that you, you begin to recognise opportunities uh, and see how you can use digital in, in many different ways. Uh, and as Simon describes, uh, you know, it's a case of testing it out and seeing what works and what doesn't work. And sometimes you'll make mistakes, as Simon has, has said, uh, but when you get it right, the, the advantages are clear uh, and the patient experience would improve. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you, Chris. That's uh, really good to see the uh, high level practical policies uh, being kind of weaved into uh, uh, the kind of on the ground activities that go into mental health uh, and the range of technologies that have been integrated into services, not just near me, but other digital tools as well. And, and a great to see evidence beginning to kind of and be generated that, that that supports clinicians in their decisions to, to use near me and provide. And that's key. The theme throughout has been that, that choice of digital as a, as a way to interact with the mental health services. Um, so we're going to just move through to a time of discussion. Um, the panelists are available for uh, questions. Um, I've, I've not looked at the chat. I've left that in the cable hands of uh, Dora and Alex. So um, what I'm going to do is just uh, open the Q&A on the one side. And um, what I might do is Let's just see what we've got. So I'm going to just ask Dawn um, what, what particular themes are coming out and, and what particular kind of questions would be good to kind of pitch to people? What, what sort of? Uh... Yeah, absolutely. One of the main ones that is coming up uh, more so for Tracy um, is the ability to launch a call prior or patient or client. Um, coming into the waiter, waiting area to have that sort of pre meet with professionals. Uh, now I know that you can launch a call as soon as a patient or a client comes in, then you can launch it. You don't need to admit them into that call so you can have that communication with other professionals within the call. But I think it's, is, is there an ability to do that prior, someone coming into the waiting area to have that sort of pre set up? Yeah, it's yeah, a great that, question. And yeah. it's actually one that we have been asked more, more, more times. It's one for our development team and it's also I think for further discussion to just to understand what the requirements exactly are around that piece of work what what you actually need to enhance group consultations and make it work for you so more than willing to to set something up after this meeting John if that's okay and we can chat that through with any group consultation participants and make sure that we get the full spec full specifications of what's required and we can take that forward. Great, thank you very much. That's fantastic. Uh, and just one of the other questions that was coming up uh, in terms of making visible the names of participants that come into the waiting area. I know we can either have initials or first name and last name. Is there an option just to have first name and not last name? No, not at the moment. It's one okay. or the other. It's initials or it's a full name. But no, there's not an option to have a first name at the minute. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Those are the main ones just now, Mark. Let me have another look, though. OK, and I think one of the things that, that we'll be doing is as an interim workaround. If you want to open up your group call before your patients arrive, uh, what we've been suggesting to do is clinicians just uh, text the waiting area link to a, a device that hold like a mobile phone. They come into the waiting area that then allows them to start that call with that kind of dummy patient, but it's actually a clinician. Uh, and then and then you can you can have that kind of pre meet if you want to. And then when, once the patients start filing in, then you can decide who to admit after the rest of them. So that, that's been a kind of interim workaround if that's helpful for some people if they want to do that. Um, let's see what else we've got. as names. So I, I see there's a, a question around screen sharing, which is which is correct, Tracy, that there are there are screen sharing abilities within the Navy group platform for both um, 
PowerPoints or slides. Um, and we've also shared kind of uh, live YouTube clips and links as well. And it comes through really clearly when we've tested it. It's really excellent when it comes through. Um, it, we'd recommend using two screens if you can, if you're going to be sharing um, media, if you, if you can access two screens when you're running a group. Um, if you can't, then, then, then sometimes sharing, uh, say, PowerPoint from an online source like SharePoint or, or your, rather than actually machines a bit easier as well. If we go, if you go to our website, the, the, the links are in the, um, the pages that have been posted up there. There's, there's information on screen sharing and how best to do that depending on what you're sharing. But yes, absolutely you can. But I, I think so this participants being the callers or participants being the um, therapists, I'm wondering whether um, at the minute, I don't think it's something that callers can do. That's correct, isn't it, Tracy? Hang on, just need to unmute yourself, Tracy. Yeah, sorry, you broke up a little bit uh, on that question, Mark. Sorry, so, yeah. my, my understanding is that it's 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 only providers that can share their screens, not not callers. Well, I, I, my, my colleague Beth's on, on the call with me here, and we are under the impression that both can share the screen, callers and providers. But we might okay. just need to double double check that with it in the group consultation. Um, scenario we know that you can do that in the individual calls but maybe for group consultations that's slightly different so if you can bear with us we're just going to check that out for you if that's okay that's great thanks tracy let me see what else we've got yeah, both can share the screen in group consultations as far as we as far as we know. OK, I like that live kind of <laughs> testing there. <laughs> and did Beth manage to get on OK in the end? Yes, yeah, she is. She's here. Right. Thank That's you. That's fine. That's cool. OK. <clears throat> uh, okay and this. So can facilitators visit the breakout rooms? That's an interesting one because that's something we we kind of spoke about the other day. I think wasn't it where where you can set up a breakout room, and 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 if you're a, a, a clinician, can you move between breakout rooms within the group consultation platform? As far as I know, you can. Yeah, so you can go from breakout one to two to three, and then back to one, and then back to the main room. That's good. That's good to know. Thank you. Okay. OK, and then someone has asked about IT support for participants. And again, that's very much back down to the, the VC support group, which the links will be in the chat. So again, <clears throat> they're able to support you as a clinician. If you're struggling to get particular patients into your group or you need to test your local networks. But what you can do with the patient's consent is that the, the VC team can contact that patient as well and talk them through some, maybe some of the challenges they're getting in. So you've got support for both there. But, but your direct access first is the VC team as a clinician, but you can enable them to have conversation with the patient. Uh, but patients can't contact the VC team direct, but a clinician can and then set up something between a patient and clinician. So that's available there for you. And then Eric has put the sequence by which you admit callers rather than admit all. Right, can you see that, that one there from Erica at 245, Tracy? Select the sequence by which you admit callers rather than admit all. No, you have to admit them all. OK, but, but you choose who gets to come in first. You can get rid of people. You, you can't, yes. That's at the, the moment, it, that's, that's the yeah. way to do it, yes. Yeah, you should select who you want to admit and then admit them all. Yeah, and I remember in the development conversations we had, gosh, 12, 18 months ago, around, you know, do we want to be singly admitting people one by one? Or if you've got a group of 30 people, surely admit all is going to be working better for you than that. So I think there was on balance, I think it was select who you want to admit and then admit everybody. Um, yeah, I think there's been, uh, there has been discussions about the setup of that in the past, but uh, that was the, the option that was decided in the end. Okay, and there's another question around. 
launch the call and then admit co-workers and an interpreter refusing. Yeah, and I suppose if, you, if you've got co-workers and interpreter, you could make them providers in that waiting area. So you could you could admit them prior to the group if you did that work around with, with sending someone a text to start with. And again, as a clinician, you want to be making sure the list you've got for that week matches up with the people that are waiting for that group as well. So again, your opportunity is to is to filter out those people before you press the admit all button. Um, because again, yes, we want you absolutely want to avoid admitting the wrong people to the wrong group. Um, but your your option to do that is is before you press the admit all button. Uh, okay. Is there anything else that's come out, Dawn, or um, from the ch earlier chat? I've not, I've not gone through absolutely everything. Anything from earlier on that we've not covered? No, the only ones we're talking about launch calls prior. OK, that's fine. Um, and again, the, the whole kind of four hour thing is going to be a, a game changer for some, I think. That's that's great to see that that on the on the horizon. <clears throat> um, I'm trying to think. But what I might do then is we've got we've got a bit of time left, so I'm going to oh, just check that. Just come through there. Um, so in terms of, um, I'm sorry, I'm getting distracted by the chat and the the Q and A now. So in terms of, you know, we've we've heard uh, the, the, the core features of Near Me and uh, the group consultations. We've had um, Simon's um, recollections and, and descriptions of how they managed in Lanarkshire and, and, and some of the things they had to kind of work around but persisted with and, and had some success with, which is excellent. And then we've got that that kind of you know call to action from Chris around, you know, th these digital tools available to us. Here's the evidence to suggest that these are good things to be doing for people. Um, so again, a real kind of rounded picture of, of where things are at. Um, what I'd like to do now is just share my screen one more time. Send that live. If we should come through. So again, what we'd like to do now in in our get myself I've got I've got Tracy there and now me and then here we go this should work now so yes so what we'd like to do again is just see see where people are at, at the end of the webinar after having all that wonderful information and learning this afternoon just again use the QR code that's on the screen there if you want or if someone could just put in the post webinar poll, which Alex has just done. So that uh, is excellent. So while people do that, I've just noticed another question that's come in. So yes, the, 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 my understanding is that the call comes to an immediate end uh, once two hours are complete. Is there any is there any warning in there, Tracy? Is there a pre kind of two hour a message at all that comes up? I've I believe that there is. I believe that there is a message that pops up, Mark, um, that, that just gives them some warning. And I think that service providers that have been confronted with this issue have made their participants aware that at some after two hours this is going to going to come to a, a, an end and they've arranged to have like a break in the middle of those meetings or a, an agreed break and then they've restarted the meetings again uh, i think that's how they've worked around it in the short term yes because i fully appreciate some patients like <coughs> like to join a group really early <coughs> and they may get it might end for them earlier than if they joined five minutes before the group started, but I think the four hour will uh, will make a massive odds to that. So, so if if folk uh, have been able to um, use the QR code or the chat just to see where we're at, I'm going to open up my other machine and just see um, what the um, results have come out like.
So at the beginning, at pre-poll, the average knowledge was around two, two and a half. And now we're at uh, three and a half to four. So that's that's really good to see. And most people hadn't used <coughs> NIMI groups prior uh, to the session today. And there are 40% would be very likely to use NIMI groups with their patients now, and 36% would be somewhat likely. So, oh, that's just changed again. 47% like very likely. Okay, so there's a real, a real nice shift in terms of knowledge, but also a, perhaps a willingness and a desire to um, use NIMI groups with patients, which is really fantastic to see. So that's a really encouraging. So I'm really thankful for the folk that have joined us this afternoon. I'm really thankful for the feedback you've given us on the um, uh, polls in terms of your shift in knowledge, but also the, the, the likelihood of you maybe trying to use near me in groups with the patients that seek help from your services. Please click on the links we've shared in the chat. What we'd like to do again is to um, draw your attention to the websites here that we have posted. What we'd like to do is, is send a PDF of the slides out to you if that's helpful or share with that, that with you later. Again, if you don't want us to contact you through the attendee list, please let us know. We've also edited this recording so it's available on our YouTube channel um, where you can look back or you can share it with colleagues that perhaps weren't able to join us this afternoon. But I think what we'll need to do now is just, is just thank our presenters today. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us and hopefully we'll see you at another one of our webinars sometime in the future. We have one specifically for AHPs coming up on the 6th of October. So if you have any AHP colleagues that were uh, interested in using the AMU groups, then please um, share that with them. It's on social media and our usual outlets. And um, thank you very much and uh, good afternoon.